I am very surprised because I know many of you just love to catch me at something and tell. <laughs> Amen? And you missed... Thank you, Clark. Uh, some more than others. Uh, but uh, you, you missed a perfect opportunity. And, and as far as I know, nobody, nobody caught it. Uh, Sunday before last, the last time I preached, uh, I, I kind of, just before we closed the service, I, I made one of my very, very few mistakes. That's not funny. I don't know if you recall. How many of you were here Sunday before last? Great. Um, I, I, I was really trying to make the point. We're talking about uh, offenses, and I was really trying to make the point that when you accept an offense, when you allow yourself to be offended, when you don't reject an offense or an opportunity to be offended, you're putting yourself in a trap. You're putting yourself in bondage. You're putting yourself in captivity, in a cage, as it were. This is a live trap, and we used that to, to illustrate it. And uh, I, was, I was really intent on, uh, on you getting that picture of when I'm near being offended, when I can feel it coming on me, when I can sense my heart racing a little bit and my anger rising up, and, I, and I'm just right on the verge of saying, okay, you've offended me now. Uh, I wanted you to have that picture of the trap in your mind, of the captivity that you put yourself in. And at the very last, I said, uh, just realize when you got your hand on it to pick it up, that you're going to hear that sound. And how many of you know there's no sound? When you're picking up on the fence, there is no sound. I wish that there were. I wish you could hear that sound every time you go to let somebody offend you. But there is no sound except in your heart where the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and saying, put it down, leave it alone, it's not good for you. Hello? Thank you very much. I had to correct that. So now can we pray and go on with today? I'm really surprised some of you didn't catch that. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the day. I thank you for such a great crowd, Father. Thank you that you're healing so many of us and getting us back up on our feet and, and feeling even better than we were before we got sick. And Lord, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that keeps us going and, and gives us life, Father. The Holy Spirit, I just ask for your anointing today to to bring forth this message the way you want it. I ask you to just take charge of my thoughts, my mind, my heart, and everything about me and just bring the word forth so that it touches lives and changes hearts and keeps us out of, of bondage and cages and, and drinking poison, hoping somebody else will die, and all of that stuff that goes along with an offense, Father. Lord, help us to understand it. And Lord, give us revelation today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, our our our, our uh, outlook for this year, our purpose for this year, our, our vision for this year is growth. Uh, we, we have a Bible study that's starting that's going to help us to grow. Uh, if you want to grow, you need to go to Miss Paula's class at nine from nine to ten, right over there in that classroom on Sunday morning. Uh, if you want to grow, you need to be in the Word. And, and everything that we're going to be teaching throughout this whole year is going to be related in one way or another to growing us in our spiritual walk our, with God and our, our understanding of God's nature and character uh, because that's what God led us to. Uh, so John 10.10, 10, uh, this is where we started when we started our series on, uh, on uh, offenses. Uh, John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, why, what did Jesus say? He said, I came and have it. How? 
more abundantly. He wants you to have more abundance than what you have now, and it's out there for you, but you have to go get it, okay? Um, Ephesians uh, 4 tells us that we're not supposed to be children any longer, tossed around by this and that. We're supposed to be growing up into mature Christians and, uh, and serving God the way he wants us to. In Psalms 119, 165, I guess this is probably going to be a, a part of us until, until we finish talking about offenses, and it needs to stay a part of you then. Uh, Psalms 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law or your word, and nothing causes them to stumble. How many of you can say that there's nothing that can cause me to stumble? Well, then you need to get more in love with God's Word if, if you can't say that. Uh, I don't guess any of us can say it perfectly, but I'm here to tell you that the more you focus on God's Word, the more you focus on, on the Scriptures and the things that God says in the Word, the more you have that in your heart, the less apt you are to stumble to be ensnared by the enemy, to be entrapped in an offense. And when you take up an offense, you're, you're in a trap, whether you realize it or not. And many times the person who offended you, as someone pointed out last week, has no awareness that they offended you, and they're, they're scot-free. They're scot-free even though they offended you. But you are ensnared by that offense, and it will, it will, it will steal from you, it will... It will set you back in your walk for, with God. It will set you back in, it will destroy families. Offenses are a horrible thing if, when we allow them to come into our lives. Um, uh, in Luke 17, uh, verse 1, uh, then Jesus said to his disciples, he says, it's impossible that no offense should come but woe to him through whom they come. Jesus warned us it, it's impossible for offenses not to come, but it doesn't mean you have to accept it. It doesn't mean you have to allow yourself to be offended. Uh, we've got to watch out for that. But the, the question I want to ask you today and what I want to talk about today is, is uh, who are you really offended at? Did you ever stop to think about that? You know, somebody does us wrong, we get offended at them, Right? Well, let's think about it today. Uh, Acts 24, uh, verse uh, 14. Paul's talking here, and, uh, and he's being chided by some, some elders and rulers and, and being accused, and, and he says, but, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they, which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers. Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept. He's talking about the elders and the rulers that, that weren't accepting the teachings of Jesus. And, uh, and he said that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust. This, I being, this being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God or man. You know, it's, it's pretty easy for us to, to know when we, when we get an offense from man, but how many of you ever been offended at God? See, not even anybody wants to admit that they've been offended with God. That's a pretty serious thing, isn't it? But whether we admit it or not, some of us, many of us, have been offended at God or by God. And, uh, and I submit to you that, that if you are offended at God or by God or with God, you're a whole lot more likely to be offended by others. And, and it's more deadly if you're offended at God than it is if you're offended at someone else. Excuse me just a minute. Are you glad I remembered? Yes. Thought you would be. Uh, anyway, I want to talk about it some more. Uh, Matthew 11, verse 1 uh, 
It says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had commanded his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Ask him, Are you the one that's coming, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, He says, You go tell John the things which you have seen, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed, blessed, how many of you want to be blessed? Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. It's important that we not offended at God or at his son Jesus or at the Holy Spirit or at any part of the, the Godhead bodily, okay? But it's so easy to do and there's so many ways and so many things that, that we can get offended at. Um, there, there's four uh, main things that I believe uh, cause us to be offended at God. And I don't know if I can get to all four of them today. I, I kind of wish we could squeeze them all in at one time so we'd get a good picture of it. But I, I guess it's more important to, to do them correctly than to try to squeeze them in. I'm, I'm trying to learn some things here and late in my life. But uh, anyway, look at Deuteronomy 28.1. One, one, of, one of the first things is, is misunder... Well, nearly all of them are connected in some way to not understanding God, not knowing the true and living God, not knowing God's character and God's love and what God's done for us. When we don't understand that, we're not only open to be offended with God, we're open to be offended with each other in a much deeper way, in a much more serious way. Uh, but in Deuteronomy... Uh, 21, it talk, uh, 28, uh, starting with verse 1, uh, it talks about the, the law and the curses. And, and a lot of people misunderstand God and the law and the curses and their places in our lives. So when things, bad things happen to them, they think you know, that they've done something wrong and God's cursing them for it. And they think that, that the, the law has got something to do with that. But, uh, but in, in verse 1, it says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all of his commandments, all of his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth, and all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you be in the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall your, shall your basket be and your kneading bowl. And it goes on blessing all the way up to, uh, to verse 14, where it says, so, shall, so, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or to the left, or go after other gods to serve them. God wants to bless you. Amen? And, and in Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, there were some, some real stickly things that he said that were contingent on you getting those blessings, okay? Uh, and so then he goes on in verse 15, and he says, but... How many of you like the buts? Huh? They're a lot worse in the Old Testament. Hello? How many of us know that? Some of us can't discern the difference between the Old and the New Testament. And, and if we don't, and if we don't understand God's grace and God's mercy and the New Covenant, then, then we don't understand God's true nature. And it's so much more easy for us to be offended at Him and everybody else, okay? Uh, it says, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. How many of you are familiar with that verse? How many of you think you might have experienced some of those things? Amen? Well, we don't have to experience them today. Amen? Oops, excuse me. Y'all going to have to excuse me. Um, 
Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall your basket be in your kneading bowl. Cursed shall uh, be the fruit of your body and so forth. It, it all comes back. If you don't do it exactly the way God said, he said, you get curses. So your, your blessings and your curses depend on your reaction to God. Amen? And, and that's still true today in one form or another, uh, but, but not in the same way that it was then, okay? And if you don't understand that difference, then we're open to, to some issues and some problems that we don't have to, to have. Uh, let's look in the New Testament at Romans 4, starting in verse, um, well, we'll start in verse 13. It says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made is of no effect. Verse 15 says, Because the law brings about wrath. The law brings about wrath. Does anybody in here know how many people in this world today are still living under God's law? I have no idea how many it is, but I know that it's tons and tons of people. If you go out witnessing to people and you ask them what it takes to go to heaven, uh, some huge percentage of them say, well, you have to be good. You have to do right. You have to do more good than bad. They give you a whole litany of things that are all based on your actions and what you do or don't do. And, and there's nothing that's further from the truth. It is based on what you do if you do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you do place your trust in Him then, and, and you don't ever recant that, then, then you are in Christ and you are a new creature. And, and these things don't have any effect on you in the same way they did in the Old Testament. You become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus the moment you trust Him as your personal Lord and Savior. But it's amazing to me still how many people don't understand that, don't agree with it, or reject it. And if you reject that, then at some point you're going to be offended at God. Because if you reject that and something bad happens to you, then what must you think? You must think, well, this is God's fault. If you, if you get sick, if you uh, wreck your car, and you lose money in the process, if, uh, if a relationship falls apart, if you lose a loved one, see, if, if you don't understand Grace, if you don't understand God's mercy and God's love and that, that he makes you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and he makes you worthy to receive all of his blessings, then, then God must have done it. And how can you not be offended at God if you think he does those kind of things to you? And the world's full of people that believe that. And, and I believe our job here at Cowboys for Jesus, a major part of it, is to help people understand the true love of God, which so many people don't. But uh, it goes on. Let me see where I was. Uh, for, for, it says, uh, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. See, that's what happens when you come to Jesus. He takes you out from under the law of sin and death, and he places you under the law of grace and, and love and righteousness. He makes you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not in cause of anything you've done, but because of what Jesus did. The blood of Jesus took away your sin 2,000 years ago on the cross. And when you accept that, it took all of your sin, not just what you did before you got saved and not what you did yesterday alone, but what you're going to do tomorrow and what you're going to do from here to eternity. It, you, and the only reason it can happen is because you're not under the law. You're still going to do things wrong. You're still going to make mistakes. You're still going to hurt people without meaning to. You're still going to do a lot of the things. You won't do near as much of the things because the love of God changes you from the inside out. And you become literally, you instantly become a new creature spiritually when you trust Jesus. And over time, your body and your actions and your soul catches up with that. We receive the word implanted, which even is able to save our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions. And we can, and we can be more, looking more like a new creature. Uh, 
It says, um, therefore, it's a faith that it might be counted to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. We're of the faith of Abraham. And we don't have to keep the law to get those promises. We got them through the blood of Jesus. Galatians 3.13, in case you're not convinced yet. Uh, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Anytime the devil says, well, you're cursed, you know that? What are you telling? Uh-uh, Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law, Satan, so get out of my life. You're not intimidating me or putting me under that bondage anymore. I'm not believing it, I'm not accepting it, and I'm not receiving it. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Uh, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We receive it through faith. And if you skip on down in that same, in that same book to, to verse 19, it says, uh, What purpose does the law serve? It was added because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through the angels by the hand of, the, of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. And the, um, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not, for there's been, there had been a law given which could have given life. If there had been a law given that could have truly given life, then righteousness would have come by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Who believe. But before, but before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would be afterward revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come... We are no longer under a tutor or under the law. You either live by law or you live by grace, by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, James 1, verse 16 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. We have to understand the law of grace, the law of righteousness, the law of, of total forgiveness in order to understand. So many people think there, and it was someone was talking about it this morning, that, that people don't feel worthy. And, and I've met with other people that, that they, they have an issue. They don't feel worthy. And, and if you're a saved Christian and you don't feel worthy, there's some things you need to learn about the character and nature of God. Because in, in Romans 8... Verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for you if you're in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation for you. And if there's no condemnation for you and you know it and believe it, how can you feel unworthy? When the blood of Jesus, when Jesus took off your old dirty robe and, and gave you his white righteous robe and put it on you and, and took away your sin, how can you not feel worthy? You have to get to the place where you have that in your, in your brain, in your heart, in your spirit, in your soul. And you, when you know that you know that you know that he did that for you, you have to feel worthy because he made you worthy. Now, if I'm thinking about me and my own fleshly actions and my own fleshly activities, man, if I dwell on that and if I think that's who I am, oh, y'all ain't going to want to know me because I will be so unworthy, you won't be able to stand me. Amen? But when I know it, when I know it, then nothing can, can affect me in the same way as far as my worthiness because I know God made me worthy and I can't mess it up. And that's a huge step in dealing with offenses either from God or from other people. 
Because if you know who you are, you're just... That's what the words what the words say over here. Great peace have those who love your law or your word and believe it, and nothing causes them to stumble. That's what the word says. And if you believe it and you understand it and you get it, you're not supposed to be made able to be made to stumble. Amen? You can resist stumbling. You're super at resisting stumbling if you really know God's Word and if you really love His Word and you really do your best to, to continue in His Word. Um, Y'all made me lose my place. Um, why... I'm finding it. I just finished James 1. We're, uh, okay, Jeremiah 17. Thank you. You're correct. <laughs> Thus says the Lord. This is one you need, you need to, to, to think about and to remember and you need to hear it because, uh, you know, we, it is possible to live in this generation and live on this side of the cross and, and get some curses. Did you all know that? I didn't say if you're a believer, but I said it's possible to live on this side and still enjoy the curses or some curses. Because Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man or woman, the person, who trusts in man and who makes flesh his strength. Hello? What are you trusting in? Are you trusting in God are you trusting in the blood of Jesus? Are you trusting in the finished work of Christ? Are you trusting in yourself or some other human being? Or some other way to get to heaven? You can't get there any other way. It says, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see good even when it comes, but shall inhabit the parched places. If you want to live there, go ahead. But for me and my house... We're placing our trust in the Lord, and in Him and Him only shall we trust. Amen? Uh, trust the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. Uh, another reason that, uh, number two reason, that we are subject to, uh, to being offended at God is not understanding biblical suffering. You know, uh, I spent a major part of my Christian life thinking that there was a place that I could achieve and I'd get up on the top of this hill and I would have learned everything I need to know about God and I would have learned His Word and I'd learned how to obey it and, and I'd do all the do's right and I'd do all the, not do all the don'ts and I'd get up to this hill and it would be a coast downhill there forever for more. How many of you know I had a roller coaster romance with God for a long time? Hello? But I, I believed that at some level. And, and I worked like a dog to get there. But I was wearing roller skates. And every time I'd skate up and get about three quarters of the way up that hill, if I ever got that far, I might have got, got a quarter of the way up. But every time, man, I'd get to thinking, boy, you're, you're really doing good. Man, you, you've learned all them do's and do's. I even did a study one time uh, in, in the church that I taught Sunday school at. I did a study on do's and don'ts. I went over to Proverbs and went through the Old Testament. And, man, I dug out all the do's and don'ts I could find, and I made a list of them. I ain't too proud of it now, but, but I did. And, uh, and, and I really tried to do the do's and don't do the don'ts. And I never did get even close to the top of that hill. And, and when I wouldn't, I'd be disappointed. And I'd, I'd quit for a while. And I'd just kind of walk away, you know. I'd say, well, I thought I was doing so good. I just, I don't know, man. It's supposed to work that way. Everybody told me it worked that way at that church I went to. But I never could make it work. Because I had it wrong. I didn't know the nature and the character of God. And I didn't know enough of his word to know that I don't live under the law. I live under grace. I live under under the, the love of God 
and the new covenant where he does all of the forgiving and he takes away the sin of the world and he takes me out from under the law so I don't have to achieve in order to receive his blessings. Amen? And, and amen. That's, when you get that, it changes your life. And I guarantee you, when I got it in, uh, in uh, 1971, it changed my life. And I don't think I fully got it till then. And I got it straight from him. But that's where he wants us to be. And that's where we need to be if we want to avoid offenses messing up our life, our witness, our testimony, our family, our relationships, our church body, and everything else that we put our finger to. You know, you've heard of the, the people that are born with a silver spoon in their mouth and whatever they touch turns to gold or silver. Well, you can't get there living under the law. I'm here to tell you. But when you get it, and when you understand that it's all God and it's all what he did for us, it changes your life. And, and you're still going to experience problems. You know, if you think you're not going to have problems going through the, the Christian life, uh, you're going to be offended all the time because you're going to have problems. It doesn't say we won't have problems. Um, but we have to understand there is such a thing as biblical suffering. Um, First Peter Four, verse 12 says, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You're going to suffer. Know it and give God the glory for it. Um, Verse, verse uh, 15 says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a busybody. Uh, suffer for God's glory. Suffer because things are going to happen and, and uh, we have to do it. Uh, Mark 15, uh, verse 17, or verse 16. Mark 4, 16 said, these are like the ones sown on the stony ground who when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness and they have no root in themselves so they endure only for a time and afterward when tribulation or persecution or suffering arises uh, for the world's sake, immediately they stumble. I stuck that word suffering in there because it goes with that and I'm not adding to the scripture or taking away from it, okay? But I think that's what it means. Uh, Second Timothy uh, 3.12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. How many of you is that? Do you really desire to live godly in Christ Jesus? Are you sure? Raise your hand real high if you mean that. Okay, hold your hand up there. Hold your hand. It says, will suffer persecution. Hello? You will suffer persecution. So don't run from it. Don't judge God when it happens. Don't put his name on it. Don't say he caused it. it he already told you, you will suffer persecution. It said, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. You've got to be assured of them before you can stay in them and be assured of them, okay? And, and we need to spend our time being assured of these things and learning them. Um, Remember the house on the rock? Remember that? Uh, Matthew 7. What did Jesus say? He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, uh, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain's going to come, the flood's going to come, the wind's going to blow, and the house will not fall because it's founded on the rock. If we get in the Word, accept what He says, believe what He says, do what He says, you're going to be on the rock. And you're going to be able to withstand it. And you will not be offended. Amen? Um, third thing, I'm, I'm hitting them kind of quickly here. Uh, the third thing, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have looked at my watch. Uh, uh, 
Romans, uh, the, what's, what's the third thing? Many people are offended over God's grace. Did you know that? Do you know that people are offended over God's grace? You know, we, we used to have this little game we play uh, that, uh, I mean, y'all, y'all all figured it out by now. You know I'm God's favorite, don't you? Huh? How many of y'all know I'm God's favorite? Well, how can we all be? We all are. God's not a respecter of persons. Amen? But, but you know, uh, when, when I first started saying that, and there was a couple of us started kind of playing the game, and, and I, I kind of started that because I really feel like I'm God's favorite. I know that I'm not. I know that we all are. But for a long time, I didn't really think I was God's favorite. But when I figured out I really am his favorite, then I know that I am. Just as much as you are. And just as much as everybody has the opportunity to be his favorite. But if we can get ourselves to feeling like we're his favorite. How many of you grew up in a home with more than one sibling? How many of those homes had one favorite? How many of y'all were it? How many of y'all were not it? Huh? How did it feel when you, know, when you weren't it and you knew it? Hello? We've got, I believe, we've got to feel like and know that we individually are as much a favorite of God as any, any human being in the world. And when we get to that place, then I believe we know and understand God at a different level. And we don't mind sharing that favoritism with everybody else in the family. But I still want to feel like I know that he loves me and I know that I'm his favorite. And when I feel that way and I know that, then I dare you to come try to offend me. Come on, give it your best shot. Some of you have tried recently. Some of you don't even think I have any feelings and you just go around all the time saying, <laughs> when's the last time one of you saw me offended? What was that for? That must be somebody who really knows me. He's probably the last one that offended me, too. <laughs> Y'all excuse me again. Offended over grace. Look at Titus 3, uh, verse 4. But when the kindness of the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Friends, we just, we just got to, to get it. We got to, before we can, can deal with our offenses, we've got to know who we are. And we've got to reconcile ourselves to what God says and that when God says it, it's finished whether we believe it or not, but we've got to learn to believe it. We've got to learn to, to pack it in our suitcase and take it with us everywhere we go. Um, I'm going to try to finish this fourth one real quick. Um, I may not finish it, but I at least want to work it in. Uh, the fourth thing that offends people is, is God's Word. Many, 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 many people are offended by God's Word. Many people, you know, what's the Word say? The word Jesus said, what did Jesus say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Do you know that that offends Many, many, many people. And, and if you're offended at that, you're in trouble. You better get over being offended at it and learn the truth. Amen? Because Jesus said it, and whether you believe it or not, it's the truth. And, and it's the only way to get there. 
But if you don't believe that, uh, I've shared it before, but, but I used to go to, to Bible to, to a, a, a meeting with some, some men that were pastors, and, uh, and they didn't all believe the way I do. And, and I would talk about Jesus and my relationship with him, and, and one of them one day looked at me square in the eye, and he says, you know, he says, I just don't get you guys that have your own personal Jesus. And I said, well, man, I'm so sorry you don't. I said, but I'll sure share him with you. <laughs> and, and the guy never did understand what I was talking about. And that's sad. We've got to, to understand it. We've got to get it. Um, what about the... the uh, First Peter 2 says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed we have tasted that the Lord is gracious, tasted that the Lord is gracious, uh, coming to him as living stones, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, and precious and precious. Don't be offended at God's word. Uh, remember the parable of, of the workers in the vineyard? This guy came out early in the morning and, and he found some guys and he sent them into his vineyard to work. He said, hey, I'll give you a denarii if you work all day. And they said, okay. And, and he came out later and he found some more and he said, well, why aren't you guys working? Well, nobody gave. Well, go on, work. I'll do what's right with you. Came out three or four times during the whole day and he came out late in the afternoon found some more, and he says, why aren't you guys working? Well, go work. I'll do what's right with you. And then when the day was over, he, uh, he came and he told his, his guy, he says, okay, pay these guys and start with the last first. And so he, they started paying the guys that went to work last. And, man, they got a denarii, whatever that is. And, uh, and, and the other ones that were there first, man, wow, wow, those guys... Those guys got what we were promised, and they didn't work but an hour. Reckon what we're going to get. They got up to the line, and guess what they got? They got what they were promised. They got a denarii. And you know what they were? They were offended. And the guy said, he said, hey, what, what I can't do what I want to with what's my own? You're judging me for being kind and, and giving somebody the same thing that you got? They were offended at him. And he was doing what he wanted to with his own, and he was being kind to people. People today get offended at God. They get offended by God's Word. And, and once you get offended at Him, you've got to get unoffended if you really want to enjoy your life. You really do. Enjoyment of the Christian life comes with knowing that the blood of Jesus Gave you everything you need for, for life and godliness. And it truly did. He gave us everything that pertains to life and godliness. When he said it is finished on that cross, it was finished. And, and that's the key. And I don't know if you've ever been offended at God. Anybody know how to, to deal with an offense with God? How do you deal with an offense with each other? You talk to each other, don't you? And you forgive. You know, what do you think about forgiving God? Huh? You say, well, you know, you first got to realize he didn't do anything wrong. It was in our imagination. It was in our perception. It was in our... Messed up brains. It was in our messed up emotions. It was in the things that hurt us growing up that left scars where we couldn't discern things correctly and, and we end up blaming it on God. But it's not God's fault. All good things are from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. God is good. God is love. That's all God knows how to do is give good gifts and love us. Sometimes it doesn't feel like love to us, maybe. But how many of you know God, the creator of the universe, knows what's good for you? 
Amen? So, you know, if, if you've had any offense with God at any time in your life, I want to just give you a minute to, to reconcile it in your own heart with him. Let's just bow our heads, please. I think most of us at one time or other have been a little bit mad at God over something or other. I know I've been a little peeved with him at times. And uh, sometimes when he's wanting me to do something I don't want to do, I, I still have a little discussion with him. But he usually ends up, no, he always ends up winning, I hope. But uh, sometimes we hide it from ourselves even that, that we're offended at God. I encourage you just to ask him, God, is there anything between me and you that I've pushed back out of my mind that I'm not, that I'm not allowing the truth to be known in my heart? Nobody's looking around. Nobody's peeking. If you want to just acknowledge by a lifted hand that, that you got something you'd like to deal with with God and, and you'd like for me to pray for you, just stick your hand up real slow and easy and nobody around you will see it or know it. There's one, amen. There's two, amen. Three, four, five, amen. Well, y'all follow me in this prayer, if you would. Just say, Father, Lord, I know you're the creator of the universe. And I know you don't make mistakes. But somehow in my ignorance or my lack of understanding, I felt like you didn't do me right at some point. And Lord, I just want to acknowledge that I know that's in me. And not you. I perceived it wrong. I didn't understand. I didn't know you well enough. And I thank you, Father, that you love me enough to, to still love me and to keep on loving me. But, Lord, I, I know that you've forgiven all my sin. And I want a good relationship with you. And I want to just re-acknowledge that I love you and I trust you. And I'm going to trust you from here on out for the rest of my life that you know best. And I'm going to accept you as the sovereign God that you are that knows the best in every situation and will always do what's good for me and will always be there to help me through every situation, no matter what it is. And I'll trust that you are going to work everything together for good because I love you and because I'm called according to your purpose. In the name of Jesus, amen. Anybody glad they came to church? Amen. 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 I'm done. Stick a fork in me. Anybody, anybody got any idea where we should go from there? Bobby Joe does. Oh, oh, okay. In my old life, me and my ex-husband were very volatile, and I used to always ask God. What did I do to deserve this? I just wanted a peaceful, normal, happy life. But I didn't realize that he was blessing that broken road that led me straight where I am today. And I couldn't be more happy or proud to be standing here today. And we couldn't be more happy or proud that she's standing here either. And I'm happy and proud that every one of y'all are standing here and, and that we are going forward this year together to grow and to learn and to build relationships and to build unity in the kingdom of God and to accomplish what God called us to do in Fisher, Texas. Amen? And wherever he leads us. Amen? 
Well, how do you know when you've been to a cowboy church? When Pastor Dennis says, Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs> 